These are the AP review questions for the chapter 6 and 7 test. So at the back of your review, you should see these five. Let's go ahead and go through them. Number 22 here asks which of the following correctly identifies which has the higher first ionization energy, chlorine or argon, and supplies the best justification. If you take a look at a periodic table, what you'll see is uh, in the P block, chlorine and argon are actually situated right here. This is chlorine, and this here is argon. So we should expect that chlorine uh, being, or argon being further down, has a higher ionization energy. Because remember, ionization energy um, increases going toward the right. The atoms get smaller and smaller and smaller, and ionization energy increases. It, it becomes progressively tougher and tougher to remove electrons. So we should say that argon has the higher ionization energy. So both of these are out. It has to be argon, but then we have to supply the correct justification or the reasoning. Now, the first part C says because of its completely filled valence shell. Now, this is true. The valence shell of argon is completely filled because it's a noble gas. However, that is not why it's tough, so tough to remove its electrons. Or the better answer would be this buzzword, effective nuclear charge. It has a higher effective nuclear charge. So the reason why it's so tough to remove electrons from argon, that, remember, is what is measured by the ionization energy, is because the electron is being held so tight. The fact that it's unreactive is because it has a filled shell and it's very stable. But the, it's so tough to remove the electron because it's being held so tight. And it's being held so tight is because the effective nuclear charge of argon is the highest. Remember, the effective nuclear charge is the measure of how strongly the electron cloud is pulled in by the nucleus. Because argon is the last member of group 3 on the periodic table, this makes argon have the highest, the most number of uh, protons. So those electrons are really feeling a stronger pull toward the nucleus. And remember, the effective nuclear charge increases as you go this way on the periodic table. So effective nuclear charge increases going toward the right. And this would then be the best answer. What you're looking for is, on the AP exam, you're always looking to use this term, effective nuclear charge. Okay, let's take a look at the second one, number 23. The table on the right shows the first ionization energy and atomic radius of several elements. And here they are. We have from boron all the way down to neon. So we're actually looking at the second energy level on the periodic table. And which of the following best helps to explain the deviation of the first ionization energy of oxygen from the overall trend? What we're saying is, as again, here's the P block of the periodic table, and we're looking at group two. So as we're going from boron to carbon and on, the ionization energy should go up, should increase, and that's what we're seeing. However, there is an anomaly at this point right here for oxygen, and they want us to know why that is the case. Here we have boron, we have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. So they want to know why oxygen, it should increase. So from boron to carbon, we're increasing, 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 and then all of a sudden we decrease. And we want to know uh, the reasoning for this. So the reason for this uh, decrease, in other words, it takes more energy to remove an electron from nitrogen than it does for, from oxygen, is recall we talked about how nitrogen has a half-filled subshell. So if you take a look at nitrogen's configuration, Nitrogen's configuration should be, we should be in the 2p subshell, and nitrogen has a configuration like this. So it have a, has a half-filled subshell, and then if you go over to oxygen, you're adding one more electron, which introduces some repulsion. And this is the point at which the repulsion is introduced. So that is the best way to explain it. There is repulsion between paired electrons in oxygen's 2p orbital. The fact that the radius um, is different really uh, is not an explanation factor. Um, the explanation factor is here in the electron configuration. And the fact that it's smaller is just a consequence of a higher effective nuclear charge. And that's the idea. Okay, let's take a look then at uh, number 24. 
Let's see if we can scroll up a little bit. Take a look at 24. And this refers back to a lab that we performed in the, this chapter. We have uh, five solutions of copper sulfate with different concentrations. We filled uh, five cubettes, each containing one of the solutions. <clears throat> then it was placed in a spectrophotometer, which is the machine that we used, set uh, to the appropriate wavelength for maximum absorbance. The absorbance was measured and recorded, and then um, it was plotted, just like we created a graph, to show the plots on the right. Which of the following is the most likely explanation for the variance of the data point? So this data point right here, notice, does not go on with the line, go along with the line, and we want to know the reasoning for it. Let's go through the options and decide which one is best. So A says the cuvette into which the 0.6 molar solution was placed had some water droplets inside. Remember, this cuvette is simply a little test tube that we filled and then we put into the spectrophotometer, and light was shown at it, and then it absorbed some of that light, and then less light came out from the back. And we measured that. That was the absorbance, a measure of how much it absorbs. So if there were a few more water droplets in here, the absorbance would actually go down because it would have made the solution less concentrated, lighter, and less light would have been absorbed. So we would have seen actually a decrease in the absorbance if that was the case. Remember, this is the absorbance, plotting the absorbance. That is not the answer. B says the cuvette into which the 0.6 molar solution was placed was filled slightly more than the other cuvettes. It turns out it doesn't really matter if you fill it a little more with water. Um, there's a certain point into which the light shines, so as long as it's above a certain, or above a certain point, it doesn't matter if you, if you fill, more, fill this up with more solution. So that is not one of the uh, points either. The wavelength setting was accidentally moved away from that of maximum absorbance. This um, also wouldn't cause it because if uh, we had a lower absorbance, if we put the wavelength at a lower absorbance, then we again should have seen a smaller absorbance. If it was, because remember we are using maximum absorbance here. And because we're using uh, maximum absorbance, everything else will show a lower absorbance. D is actually the correct answer. The cuvette used for 0.6 molar solution had not been wiped clean. So if our cuvette has a bunch of fingerprints on it, then those fingerprints will actually absorb some of the light. And it will show a higher absorbance than usual. So that is the best explanation for this higher absorbance. Some of the fingerprints absorbed some of the light, essentially. Let's go on to the next one. Let's pull it up a little bit. Looks like we have graphs for each one of these. Now this one is actually something you haven't seen before, and you'll find that you'll get hit with these types of AP questions on the exam. And the way to go about it is to logically think about, even though you haven't seen the graph, logically think about it. So let me, let's analyze it here. A sample containing atoms of carbon and fluorine was analyzed using X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So we haven't discussed this and probably won't. I don't have an X-ray photoelectron spectrometer, so no worries there. Uh, the portion of the spectrum showing the one S peak for the for atoms of the two elements is shown on the right. Which of the following correctly identifies the one S peak for fluorine and provides an appropriate explanation? So the one S peak essentially is measuring how the one S electron um, is deflected or how much energy there is in the one S electron. Remember that fluorine for fluorine, you've got two energy levels. You've got the one S two and two S two and two P should be seven for fluorine. I'm sorry, not two P seven, two P five, apologize. Thank you. Two P five, you have seven total in the second uh, shell. So we're looking for this electron here, or these electrons. Now for carbon, uh, you have a similar arrangement, except you have two P two. So uh, for carbon, one S two, two S two and two P two for carbon. And so this one's for fluorine. We're looking in both cases at these electrons. <clears throat> now, which element should we expect the 1s electrons to be held tighter toward the nucleus? Well, looking at the periodic table trends, we see that carbon being further along on the periodic table, here's the P block again. Carbon is right here, and fluorine is right here. Carb fluorine being further down will have a smaller size. Remember, carbon is bigger. 
and fluorine will have the higher ionization energy. And that smaller size means that the electrons are held tighter to the nucleus because fluorine has more protons, pulling those electrons closer to the nucleus. So fluorine's electron, 1s electron, is held tighter. Because it's held tighter, it should show a much higher energy. So in fact, if we take a look, um, this binding energy increases. Notice that it increases as we go toward the left, not as we go toward the right. So we should expect this to be the peak for fluorine because it, it is a at a higher energy and at a higher intensity. So peak X, then we should pick peak X, except let's pick uh, the right explanation because fluorine has a smaller first ionization energy than C has, uh, or peak X because F has a higher nuclear charge than C has. And again, nuclear charge is what you want to uh, pick, effective nuclear charge. Um, the first ionization energy is true that fluorine has a higher first ionization energy, but that doesn't explain why the S1 electron is held so much tighter. It's because of those extra protons in the nucleus. So hopefully, uh, this, is a, this was a strange, maybe, discussion, but hopefully you can see the logic behind this. And this is what you're asked to do on some of these tougher AP exam questions. We actually have one more, don't we? Let's take a look at this very last one. And uh, we discussed this sort of thing in class a little bit, so this shouldn't be too bad. We have um, the ionization energies for some element X unknown listed in the table above. And on the basis of this data, element X is most likely to be. You'll notice that there's a jump with every successful, uh, successive electron being taken away. However, there's a huge jump between the third and the fourth electron being taken away. There's a very, very big jump here, which means this is an element whose, whose fourth electron is a core electron. So if you take a look at the periodic table, technically the element who is, uh, which is three steps away from a noble gas, for that element, the fourth electron will be a core electron. And if you take a look at the periodic table, a sodium is actually the first in the first group. Uh, this is group 1, or 1A. Magnesium is in group 2A. Aluminum, however, is in group 3A. Being in group 3A, it has three valence electrons available. And after those three are taken away, the fourth electron will be a core electron. So aluminum is actually the answer. Um, this is in uh, 4A and this one's in 5A. So aluminum then would be the answer. So think about this, think through this. Hopefully you've enjoyed this little review. Be ready, these will show up on the exam.